And uh, the, my talk basically is the second part of uh, Colin's talk this morning at the extension, and uh, also uh, in comparison to Zaza's talk just before me, and it's very interesting. So I would like to, to answer the, the questioners, the last questioners, <laughs> uh, question about the why uh, we picked the basal fibrate to start with. And uh, okay, so, so th that's the question. What is basal fibrate? And Zaza already gave you the answer, right? What is the basal fibrate? It's a well studied and uh, marketed the drug for uh, dyslipidemia and uh, uh, used for more than 25 years in Europe and in Canada and in Asia. So the toxicity is, uh, is well understood and uh, it's very effective for uh, control the uh, lipid in the blood. And then the question is why uh, should we try uh, try basal fibrin on Barth syndrome? So I, I would like to trace the reasonings uh, uh, which uh, already like six years ago. Okay. So the, here is a, a recent uh, review about the PGC1 alpha pathways. And uh, you can see. So which one is the pointer? Oh, okay. Yeah. And look at, yeah, here, the center, the master regulator of mitochondria biogenesis, and uh, it can uh, activate many pathways, including uh, the, the nuclear respiratory factor one and two, and the estrogen related receptor, and uh, of course, uh, with the collaborate with the, the PPARs. So, and uh, the, the function of PPAR actually is two ways, and the PPAR activation also activate uh, PGC1 and alpha. So it's a, uh, so both ways. So uh, we, we look at this uh, a few years ago, and uh, we, we reasoned that, uh, let's see, we reasoned that, that, yeah. So remember on this one, yeah, there are two things the obvious. So we have a basal fibrate, which is a, a drug that can activate PPAR, this pan, the PPAR activator, and which will activate further PGC1 alpha and results in uh, increased uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. And here we have another compound uh, which is yeah, studied by many labs, and uh, with respiratory and uh, through uh, CERT1 pathway also activate uh, PGC1 alpha and the results in. Uh, increase mitochondrial proliferation. And uh, it, it, worth mentioning here is that, remember here, uh, PGC1 alpha activation also increase the activities of a, a nuclear respiratory factor, which mainly uh, responsible for upregulated uh, antioxidant uh, systems. So we reason that we, we, we can increase uh, biogenesis of mitochondria, but at the same time also increase the antioxidant system. So that's one of the, the reasoning like five or six years ago, actually. And here is our, at that point, we have a very naive uh, reasoning here. Yeah. So we say the basal fibrate and respiratory stimulate mitochondrial biogenesis by activating, by activating P7 alpha, of course. And the mitochondrial biogenesis requires de novo synthesis of cardiolipine. Uh, and we know the cardiolipin synthesis is normal in bars, and because uh, tafazin does not affect cardiolipin synthesis. So by stimulating uh, cardiolipin synthesis, and uh, we may alleviate cardiolipin deficiency phenotype in the bars. So that's the very naive reasoning. So we, we actually did uh, some simple experiment using the conditions uh, uh, present at uh, that point in the literature, so using uh, 400 micromolar basal fibrate or the 75 micromolar respiratory and on, on, the, on this mouse embryo derived fibroblast cells that is knocked out in tafazin and which actually provided by Zaza to our labs. So that was a collaboration like five years or five, six years ago. 
and uh, then we after one week treatment and we we, we collect the cells and measure the cartilipin profile by mass spec and and we measure the respiratory uh, the oxygen consumption uh, in a in a very crude uh, so-called uh, oxygen biosensitive which is before the the seahorse so okay so so this is a uh, very yeah original data just before yeah we have any seahorse uh, instru instrument and so it shows that actually the treatment with the basal fibrin or with the resveratrol increase the rate of uh, oxygen consumption by, by the TAS uh, knockout cells uh, in culture. And secondly, yeah, we want to look at what is the cardiolipin profile. Remember, yeah, the cardiolipin profile, the cardinal uh, characteristic of Barth syndrome is the, is the ratio of a uh, monoacetyl cardiolipin over cardiolipin. And uh, this is a characteristic uh, indicator. So we want to use this ratio. We look at it here. You see, here is uh, uh, the wild type, the mouse uh, knockout, wild type cardiolipin uh, spectrum. So the cardiolipin here and the very little amount of cardiolipin. And when you treat wild type as fibroid, it doesn't change much. And here is a TAS knockout mouse cell in culture, and you see it's very prominent uh, monolysocardin peaks and uh, reduced cardiolipin peaks. And also you see the shifting of the peaks, so there's a molecular species changes. And here is the critical experiment. That was a surprise to us because we did not expect this, actually. And uh, when we treat the cell with the basal fibrate, and we see this ratio start to change, and we have more cardiolipin now compared to the, the task, and the less, or uh, at least the ratio of uh, monolithic cardiolipin over cardiolipin and change for the better. And similarly, if we do this uh, with the resveratrol, we see the similar shift and if we quantitate it, uh, and we see uh, in the wild type cells, uh, either you treat it with drugs or without, and uh, you have very little uh, monolithic cardiolipin, so the ratio is very low. And uh, with the tabazine uh, knockout, you see very high ratio, and with the treatment of this uh, type of deficient cell, you see the, the partially rescue is uh, abnormal um, monolithic cardiolipin cardiolipin ratio. So this is a, a, to us a surprise because we, we, we really couldn't make, uh, make a hypothesis exactly how this could happen because we thought these drugs, if they increase mitochondrial biogenesis, you just get more mitochondria, but it's still bad, and why they should change the ratio, and what is the connection there? Yeah. So actually, these things happen, we also tested on the, the human patient's uh, skin the fibroblast biopsy, the fibroblast in the culture, and uh, so these two drugs also change the ratios of uh, the human patient cells, so that was uh, consistent and encouraging. So. Then we look at this diagram and to think about what could be the reason why uh, these things happen and this ratio change. And at this point, actually, uh, we want to also test whether th this is just the weird effect of the drug that changed the cardiolipin or it has really something to do with the PGC1 alpha or with the CERT1. That's, we want a genetic test whether we can increase genetically, not with the drug, genetically, but if we increase uh, the PGC1 alpha expression or increase CERT1 expression, do we see this change of a uh, cardiolipin profile? So this is, uh, was done actually only recently uh, with our Drosophila model, and we can uh, make a tafacin deficient uh, Drosophila strains and let it overexpress either CERT1 or PG7 alpha. And you can see the cardiolipin, uh, monolithic cardiolipin over cardiolipin ratio also reduce towards uh, the wild type, the, the, although this partially. Yeah. But it is consistent yeah, with that diagram I just showed, the, the mechanistically. 
So only recently, uh, in our lab, actually, yeah, mainly it's Michael's work, and it really clarified how does the the resveratrol uh, could affect uh, cardiolipin monolysis carbon ratios. And uh, the paper is just coming out actually next month in print and online already last month. And uh, the point is, uh, we identified the loss of protein association cause cardiolipin degradation in Barth syndrome. And the base, uh, because of that, the paper is very uh, detailed and complex and uh, it's beyond uh, the, our time to discuss here. But I just want to mention a few salient points, the, the results from that paper. Is the tafasin deficiency in the Barth syndrome actually shorten the half-life of cardiolipin? Remember, the cardiolipin synthesis is normal inside the cell. Why, without, cardi uh, without tafasin, cardiolipin deplete and uh, accumulate monolithic cardiolipin? There is, before, there was no rational explanation, actually. And uh, until now, yeah, only until now, we identified, yeah, our lab identified, actually, this is the, the shortening of the half-life if you don't have tafasin. And we found in monolysocardiolipin actually accumulates in the intact cell, in the intact mitochondria. It's not because of a, a degradation through the autophagies uh, or in the lysosome. And the third of uh, the conclusions we have is that the cardiolipin, but not monolysocardiolipin, is tightly bound to proteins, and especially yeah, the super complexes in the mitochondria. And it is this interaction with the, the supercomplexes and in the mitochondrial membrane that stabilizes the cardiolipin. And uh, yeah, so what basal fiber or resveratrol does is that they promote supercomplex formation. So that indirectly stabilizes the cardiolipin. So that we think is the reason why these two drugs uh, can can ameliorate this uh, monolithic cardiolipin accumulation problem or the cardiolipin degradation problem in the Barth syndrome. Okay. Okay, so with that knowledge, and uh, we, uh, a few years ago, and uh, like five years ago, five, six years ago, we actually attempted with Colin uh, a little a mouse experiment, treating uh, the task knocked down mice with uh, the basal fibrate or resveratrol in this case. And uh, we, we, we have this experiment uh, all planned, but then we have some results uh, with uh, the echo, the stress echo, but, but uh, the sandy hit and we lost all the animals. So we have to start from the uh, beginning. So actually we, we, we did have some preliminary results from that experiment and you can see the the heart rate response was rescued by uh, resveratrol or basal fiber treatment. And previously, this one is a fractional shortening. It was not a, a rescued by the uh, treatment with the basal fiber or resveratrol. So at that point, uh, just r uh, right after Sandy, and with, with this preliminary result, with the cell culture results, with the uh, very limited animal results, and uh, and Matt uh, yeah, contacted us and organized organize a, a meeting with Zaza with us. So, so asked us to, to, to provide a pharmacology report for FDA to, to apply for uh, the orphan drug designation for basal fibrate. Because at this point, our reasoning is that because basal fibrate is an existing drug, so it's a low hanging fruit. So we can directly test on patients if we have some more convincing data in the animal. But resveratrol, although behaving better actually than basal fibrin, but it's a compound and uh, we're going to spend a lot of more time uh, to get that approved. And uh, with our reason is that we should get things going. And uh, once we establish the clinical trial the setups and uh, more compound will be easily tested, but we start to get the, uh, the setup. So that's why we, we first approach the FDA to get this approved as a, a designated as a orphan drug designation. Uh, although FDA has not approved uh, the, the indication that they need still more uh, animal experiment. So that's why 
we restarted after the sandy. We started restarted the colony, and the mice colony, and restarted the the whole program uh, test. Okay, so now we we have to answer uh, some questions. Uh, so first one we want to test is can fibro uh, uh, basal fibroid rescue the the so-called prenatal cardiomyopathy and the lethality in, in our prenatal task knockdown model and uh, described yeah, by Colin this morning and we published uh, a few years ago. Remember, in, there, in that case, we have a, a two milligram per ml doxycycline feeding the, the pregnant uh, mother. And in that case, we have a 100% lethality so nobody reach uh, the winning, so they all die either before delivery or yeah, pre, either prenatal or perinatal. So we thought this is, could be a quick check if uh, by the fiber treatment of the pregnant mother, if we see any survivors, that could be very quick test uh, whether it's effective. So unfortunately, uh, this is just uh, our uh, tallies of uh, how many uh, how many liters we, we made it, and uh, how many uh, female we made it, and how many liters we get. So the bottom line is the basal fiber treatment, <laughs> the negative effects the pregnancy in mice, so we can't really do the experiment in mice because we don't have any survivors, even the wild type died. And so somehow, yeah, the, this uh, basal fiber is, is toxic to the pregnancy, okay? So then we move on to our second model which is uh, can basal fiber ameliorate cardiomyopathy in the adult onset test knockdown model. And this, this morning, Colin also yeah, mentioned, and actually yeah, she, he has used the result of the control arm of, the, of this exper experiment. Yeah, okay. So here is uh, the data. Um, so I, I hope you still remember uh, our uh, test there. We, we use a different protocol. So we treat the mice postnatally. So at about uh, two or three months of age, we start to treat. So we start to induce first, right? Induce with the doxycycline, but at the same time, we treat with basal fibrin. And it's different from Zaza's model is that we're not really uh, stress them during this period of treatment. But we, our uh, echo, test of the, the contractility and the heart function actually is a stress echo. So at that point, when we test, we do the echo, we inject uh, isopaternal and it really stress the heart and to see how they react, uh, how they function under stress. So here uh, is experiment. Uh, basically, we just look at the, the, the body weight of the mice and obviously you can see uh, the task knocked down really reduce the, the body weight. And uh, basal fibroid actually also reduce body weight. So you have a wild type control and you have a TAS control in the blue. So in general, TAS is usually lighter than the wild type. But if you treat both wild type and TAS with basal fibroid, the wild type get lighter and TAS get even lighter, okay? And here is the, our so-called LV hypertrophy index plot. And Colin this morning already described how we do that uh, quantitative the hypertrophy. And here we have the result is that at least uh, the nine months of treatment, this point you can definitely see, although the trend is there to begin with, at this point on the nine months of treatment and induction and treatment. So the basal fibroid treatment actually really uh, reduced the LV hypertrophy, uh, which otherwise would be much higher. You see, this should be here. But if you treat with basal fibroid, they're reducing significantly towards the wild type. And the basal fibroid treatment to the wild type, in contrary to Zaza's data, it did not change the, the ventricular wall thickness to the significant extent. 
but really yeah, reduce the hypertrophy of the, the task. Nice, okay. And uh, then we tested uh, the heart rate response because uh, we inject the uh, isoprotonone during the uh, during the echo, and uh, we expect you have an increase of a heart rate. And uh, this on the left is a, a baseline before we inject. We we have a measurement of a heart rate, and on the right is uh, after ten minutes uh, post post uh, isoprotonone injection. You see, of course, the the heart rate is much higher than the before injection, and. Uh, here, uh, the conclusion is the, the heart rate response uh, to ISO are uh, uh, blunted uh, by, by the Tafazi knockdown, but this uh, treat, uh, fiber treatment did not really improve this response. Okay. And here is the, the fractional shortening uh, data and uh, the baseline we have uh, observed, as Colin mentioned uh, this morning, somehow the task knocked down now uh, the baseline without the uh, ISO stimulation has a, a the stronger contraction than the wild type and uh, Adam sort of provided some explanation of whether we should measure the lumen or measure the middle of the, the wall. Right? That could solve that problem. We, we couldn't explain why is that. But whatever the reason, the basal fabric does not change that. But here, this important is uh, the post uh, stress echo, the echo, the 10 minutes uh, post ISO. So ta Tafazi knockdown actually reduce the the contractility uh, significantly, but the basal fabric treatment did not improve the contractility. So. Then we, at the end, we we yeah we sacrificed NOS and uh, measured the cardiolipin profiles of the the heart, and uh, you can see. Uh, you can see yeah here on this panel it, these are Tavasi knockdown mice plus uh, basal fiber treatment. These are wild type plus, uh, but you can see the obvious patterns. So the, the cardiolipin peaks here and the monolysis cardiolipin peak. So here is uh, the typical. Model less cardiac peak is still there as compared to the the real knockdown. So basically, the basal fiber treatment did not improve the model less over cardiac ratio in Tafazi knockdown mice. So that's the summary of what we observed. Okay, we just mentioned. Yeah. So then it is the problem that uh, along among all those uh, indicators, then only one seems improved which is uh, the left ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, we're still at loss on why this has happened without improvement of monolysic cardiolipin over cardiolipin ratio, we see some improvement in the, in the heart. So that's uh, wh what we're at now. Yeah, here's the acknowledgement and uh, the most of the uh, experiment are done in the lab, uh, in the Shlami run and uh, Phone labs, basically, with Young, me, and uh, Michael, and uh, occasionally we have a student, student rotate through the lab and help some experiments. And thank you very much. Dim Dong, time for one or two questions. I had a great presentation. And very interesting with the benzofibrate. I, I believe the fibrates are, are for um, uh, uh, hyperlipidemic drugs, so they're, they're going to decrease lipids, circulating lipids in the blood. And I, I'm not sure if this has been confirmed in the TAS mouse, but the hypolipidemia or hypocholesterolemia that is, occurs in Barr syndrome. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think if, we, if we're decreasing cholesterol, perhaps, with the benzofibrate treatment to an extent that it starts to impair membrane homeostasis uh, further, right? So, uh, so attacking cholesterol or, or, or lipids might, in this way, with this kind of, a, of, a, of an approach, might, f in another way, impair membrane function. Well, you are talking about the extent that's affecting the cell membrane already. I, I don't think that, <laughs> because you get most of your cholesterol through your diet. Right? 
I think it's mostly synthesized. No, from, most from synthesized. Liver. Yeah, and I think it'll be dropped with with fibre rates. So I just we, we've done similar studies in our in our heart failure monitor Jen and I over the years. Mm -hmm. We have never published yet, but with with phenofibrate, and we see a similar. We actually saw more with what Zaza saw uh, uh, an in, increase in function, but a but a decrease in mitochondrial function, decrease in in cardiolipin. And, but then over time, it becomes more cardiomyopathic. And so I always mm -hmm. wondered whether, especially in this case, whether if, if you have a problem with membrane homeostasis already and you drop cholesterol further, like in Barr syndrome, if that could be a sort of an unfortunate side effect of, of this potential. So it does so many things, th these FIBAR agonists. But, I, but if it's yeah, I don't problem. have any information about the, yeah, that level, yeah, the drop. Uh, as, I, as I go over to Colin, I just want to remind people that fibrates, you wouldn't approve a fibrate if you just relied on rodent models because it makes their livers uh, huge and hepatomegaly. So, uh, but they're very effective in humans. And so why? Well, there's a difference between men and mice. I'm kind of hoping that whatever positive things were there before may still be there in the human condition. But here's Colin. Mindong Zaza has already commented on the fact that the doses that he was using bezofibrate were something like 30 to 80 times what you would use in a human. How did the doses that you use compare? So we use the exact same as uh, uh, Zaza's because actually we coordinated the, the test uh, the, 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 and they use uh, different protocols now so we thought that with different protocols we may discover different aspects. Yeah, it's just so difficult, isn't it, to know how to extrapolate that information or back towards a more physiological dose that we would use, at least for the hyperlipidemia therapy in but humans. For, in the literature for mice, most of them used, yeah, we followed the, uh, the protocol that most lab used for testing in mice, but of course mice are not human, and uh, so uh, the liver uh, aspect, of the, the defect uh, in mice actually is not present in human. The, the toxicity to the liver, and as I mentioned. Yeah. Thank you, Rent. 